Welcome to the Listen Up Podcast, where we explore hearing loss, communication, connections, and health. Hey, this is Dr. Mark Sims here. I'm the host of the Listen Up Podcast, where I feature top leaders in healthcare. This episode is brought to you by Arizona Hearing Center. I help patients to effectively treat their hearing loss so they can connect better with their family and friends and remain independent. The reason I'm so passionate about helping patients with hearing loss is because I lost my brother Robbie twice, first from his hearing loss from radiation to his brain tumor, and then again when he passed away. I only care for ears. I'm the ear of ENT who's performed over 10,000 ear surgeries over the past 10 years. I'm the founder of Arizona Hearing Center. I'm the author of my new book, Listen Up. Go to listenuphearing.com to learn more about it. Today, we have Dr. Rodney Perkins. Dr. Perkins received his medical degree from the Indiana University and completed his surgical residency at the Stanford University School of Medicine. He also serves as a professor emeritus of surgery at the Stanford University School of Medicine. Dr. Perkins has a long history as a pioneer in the field of otology. He's been credited with developing various surgical procedures and instruments. Every week, I use the Perkins retractor, which he developed. As a physician entrepreneur, he's founded over 13 successful companies, including Resound Corporation, Sound ID, Procept, and also EarLens. I'm excited to have him on, on today. Dr. Perkins, welcome to Listen Up, and thanks for coming on. Good to be here, Mark. Oh, that's great. I very much appreciate your time. I know you're a busy guy working on a lot of great stuff. Hey, you know, one of the things I like to ask people, Dr. Perkins, is like, you know, I'm always fascinated about people's medical journey, right? Like, how did they end up getting into medicine? So how did you end up getting into this wonderful field of medicine? Well, it, uh, I think, um, you know, you start out and you drift one way or another. But uh, uh, when I uh, left high school, I was actually going to be an engineer. And I decided that uh, I would that had some limitations to it, although there was uh, nothing wrong with that. And I uh, had done a lot of work on sculpting and uh, model airplanes and sculptor pieces and a lot of hand stuff. And uh, I, uh, in high school, we had a aptitude test and my aptitude came out uh, that I liked things scientific, but I like to do things with my hands. And so the natural thing was an oral surgeon or to carve something, right? right. Uh, and I got into that. Uh, that's what I thought, okay. Uh, but I was thinking about medicine a little. And when I uh, went to sign up with my good buddy in the field house at Indiana University for your major, he was in front of me. And he said he was going into pre-dent. And I wasn't sure what I was going to do. So I was right behind him there turned to me and said, what, what are you going to do? I said, well, I'll do pre-dent too, knowing that the first quarter or the first semester was the same. But after that first semester, I sp switched to pre-med because I, I just had, had more things you could amplify and interesting things. And, uh, and I liked the idea of doing that. And that, that was very helpful because surgery in the ear is, you know, working with shaping things and getting in uh, in there and out safely. And so it utilized those basic skier, skills uh, that uh, I had had developed before. So how'd you get from medicine to otology? Well, that uh, was, I think the idea there was that uh, one other thing I might mention, and you can edit this, of course, can't you? Uh, one other thing, uh, just a little thing that was interesting that I think really got me interested in medicine was when I was about, I don't know, seven, eight, nine, maybe I read comic books. And in the back of the comic book, you could order a live alligator from Florida. Now, for a kid in Indiana, that was a pretty big deal. Right. And so I saved my money and I ordered the uh, alligator. And it finally came in a box. I opened it up and the alligator didn't move. And I thought, well, I don't know, maybe they're sleeping. And so my mother finally told me, Rodney, the alligator's dead. And so I thought, they'll never believe me. I wrote a letter. They sent me another one. I opened it up. It was dead, too. And I thought, I'll try one more time. And I did. And the alligator came. It was still alive. I put it in a little tub with a brick so it could dry off. And that it bird seed in the water. And uh, that lasted for uh, two or three weeks. 
and the alligator died. And I decided, well, alligators weren't for Indiana. And uh, <laughs> so I took it out back to bury it. And I had always uh, carved things and always had a knife with me as a kid. I just I did a lot of whittling. And I thought, I wonder what the inside of this alligator is like. So just before I put it uh, in the grave, I opened its abdomen and chest and looked to see what was there. And I could see the intestines and you could even recognize the heart and the lungs. And, and I just thought that is really interesting. And I think that's probably where the kind of turning boyhood things into interest in medicine started. So it's funny, Dr. Perkins, as you mentioned that there are a couple things. One is I did a ton of uh, carpentry and uh, wood wood building as a child. And uh, <clears throat> in the back of my comic books, there was you could build a hovercraft, but you needed a vacuum cleaner engine, uh, the motor. And my, mm -hmm. my mother let me order the set, but she never let me take the motor out of her vacuum. So I, I actually <laughs> never got to build the uh, hovercraft, but uh, I tried this. Yeah, yeah. So, well. Well, you might be running SpaceX by now if you, she'd let you use her back. Yeah, so the, what limitations I have. But uh, I, actually, I think uh, in the day, the utility of keeping the house clean with six kids uh, probably mm. made much more sense than uh, me taking the motor out of her. Right. Cleaner, but right. Anyway, so that, yeah. that's a great story. And so you uh, then went and decided otolaryngology was your or ENT or how did you get into ENT? Well, I was... Uh, I was going to go into cardiovascular surgery, and that's what I had been doing uh, for a long time. As an undergraduate, I could go in, I, I was eligible to go in medical school after three years, but I was younger, a year younger, and I decided I'd stay, take some other courses, and as a junior undergraduate, I took the medical school physiology course. And so this fourth year of college, I was a TA in the lab. Uh, in, and a lot of it was cardiology and putting, you know, adrenaline on hearts and watching them beat faster and all that sort of thing. And so I got interested in cardiovascular physiology. And then when, um, in later years in medical school, I was a student assistant in the uh, advanced cardiac, uh, cardiac surgery research lab and a student manager for the neurosurgery re uh, research lab. And so I really got interested in those things. And out of that, uh, I, my job was to take care of the dogs and prepare them for surgery. We were putting micro valves in. Right. And, uh, and there was a disc oxygenator. And my job was to cool down the dogs. And you put them in an ice bath. And it was really messy and cold and everything. And I thought there's got to be a better way of doing this. And I, and those discs on a disc oxygenator pick up the film of blood and move it through a oxygen atmosphere. And that's how it oxygenates. But the surface area on those discs looks like, look like a refrigeration fan of some sort and a great surface area. And so I converted that with put an axle in it that, that you could run hot and cold water through in the axle. None of the water got in the blood but it would cool and warm those fins. And I could change the temperature four, deg you know, four degrees in very to almost okay. anything in four, four minutes time. Wow. So that won a national research prize. And then I was going to go into cardiovascular surgery. And about that time, I had an ear operation on my eardrum and I started looking into that and the microscope was just coming in. Uh, I won that national prize for the medical student division, and part of it was to go to the AMA convention with an exhibit. All expenses paid, a big deal for a medical student. So I went to that, and one afternoon uh, there, the guy who won the resident division, he said, hey, you should see what my this guy from my hometown's doing. He's taking out the little stapes bone and putting a little plastic tube in. And uh, he said, you ought to go over and see that. He's using a microscope. And he said, you know, I've heard you give this pitch a hundred times. I can give it for you if somebody comes by. <laughs> so, I, so I went over and I met John Shea and, and I looked at that. And then I drove down to see him a couple of times from Indianapolis, you know, drive overnight. And I just wanted to see the procedure. And I saw that. 
And I, at the time, I thought this microscopic surgery is going to open up a whole new era of surgery and, a, and different possibilities. And so I changed at that time, although I had, you know, I, 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 I was going to get into a good uh, cardiovascular program, but I just thought uh, I like this other and it was very inventive and everything. So that's kind of how I got into it uh, was from that uh, avenue. That's great. That's an amazing story. I was interested how people, you know, end up in otology. But so you met John Shea and that was uh, kind of it. And then you decided to go train at Stanford, I assume. Well, I was uh, I wasn't sure I'd take a residency. I had I interned at Parkland in Dallas and I moonlighted over in Fort Worth. And a guy over there was a otologist and uh, he said he would train me. And then John Shea said I could come back, spend some time with him. But then I thought, well, you know, that's uh, it'd be good to get an education in in the whole area, and uh, so I went down to Stanford and uh, uh, got in that program. And the rest is history. You've been here since, ever since, right? Yeah, mm-hmm. that's great. That's great. So I know you have a lot of different inventions, Doctor Perkins. So uh, tell me, what's your favorite invention? Like out of all the things you've developed, what's your favorite? You can have multiple, but uh, you know, well. Um, I, I I think that, uh, well, first of all, they started uh, in ear surgery. I would see a problem and there was no solution to it. But I thought, well, if you could do A, B, and C, you could improve that, that, that problem or solve that problem. But there weren't the instruments to do it. And instruments, people say they have a standard set of interest, instruments. Well, you're dead in the water because standard set of instruments are not what you need to make make a change usually and yeah, I, I many tell, times i tell people it's like um uh, a chef with their knives right you need special yeah. knives to be able to do stuff well so, I'm yes sorry. Exa- exactly right and so i would first of all develop different instruments and then i would develop a kit to do something and then uh, and then a little while it, you needed a company to do it for instance in laser stapedotomy uh, I needed a laser that could be very accurate, and I and I looked into that, and and laser scope came out of my interest in doing safety surgery, right? And, and so that turned out to be well and used in many other things. Um, I would say that uh, uh, one of the things uh, that uh, I th- I would say Procept, which is a biorobotic company for prostate, I'm. Uh, the co-founder of that and that technology, which was really developed by my associate, my other younger um, co-founder, he just did a fabulous job, very, very uh, intuitive and uh, terrific engineer. I think that's a good contribution. I think Earlands uh, is the idea of being able to uh, get all the frequencies with very little feedback. It, it was a significant thing. And uh, um, because I think that that can help so millions of people uh, potentially, uh, and and uh, get the, get the kind of sound that allows you to hear speech better and noise, and to also um, improve the quality of life, and keeping you in the game as you get older. Well, speaking of ear lens, which is something you know you and I uh, share in common. Obviously, we both utilize the device. How did you come up with the idea for ear lens? I've seen your earlier prototypes, but uh, tell me a little bit about that story or how the where the idea came from. Well, that began back in the Resound days. Resound was a, a hearing device company now, one of the big six, and uh, that um, that I uh, founded in the eighties. And uh, I was doing some experiments at the same time at the California Ear Institute at Stanford, and that was putting a magnet on the center of the eardrum and then vibrating it with a device that was a coil with a ferrite core in a casing down in the ear canal with that magnetic field would vibrate the magnet. And what we did, we glued the magnet on the umbo at the center of the eardrum. And we did that with new skin and it would stick on there for a while and we do the experiments. And one time, guy came in for a one month experiment or a two month or some periodic place that we checked their hearing. And I looked in and the thing had fallen off because uh, 
if you glue something on the eardrum, it'll get sloughed off because the skin is sloughing and it's migrating. And so I was very disappointed that I wasn't going to be able to check that guy's hearing at that stage. And the thing looked just like a contact lens. The, the glue had dried and it was a little uh, circular thing. And I thought, how does a contact lens stay on? Maybe I could get this thing to stay on to do the hearing test. And I actually had some antibiotic eardrops that were kind of oily. Uh, and, uh, and I just took a drop of that, put it on the center of the eardrum, and dropped that back on and it jumped on like a contact lens. And it stayed there for, you know, over a month or more. Wow. But then, then we said, well, let's just keep some fluid, oil there. So we put mineral oil in it every once in a while. And it kept it. And an associate who, who you may remember, uh, Dick Good, yeah, who was another professor at, at Stanford, I put one on him and it stayed for four years. So we know that principle is how it stays. And so that that gave me the idea that we could get better sound, a bigger frequency range, and more gain by doing that because the impedance match with directly putting that energy into the malleus and the and the uh, umbo area uh, allows you to get the high frequencies, which you cannot get with any known hearing aid because it's uh, the limitation of the small speaker in a hearing aid that doesn't allow that to occur. Right. And, and so that was how that invention came about. And I think one of the things that it does point out, one thing that we all are going through life and you got to think of the world as being full of information everywhere you are. And there are two kinds of people in the world. There are the uh, spoon carriers and there are the fork carriers. And the fork carriers are out in this rain and that's falling through the tines of the fork. <laughs> and the spoon carriers are out there and they're collecting these bits of information. And, and I would like to analogize it to uh, you always want to have your radar on receive. Information is always there, but you have to have a, a sense of receiving it. When you see something, you think of why didn't that work or what could make that work? And that that is kind of something that I think is kind of illustrated by that. You saw I saw that. And so that that gave you the idea that, that you could do something with it. Yeah, I, I, I say to people there, you know, don't think of them as problems, think of them as interesting problems, right? In other words, mm -hmm. don't think of them as an obstruction, think of them as something that maybe you can solve, which is much more mm -hmm. interesting than just something that prevents you from doing something. Right, yes. So. Yeah, and it, and then you, you amplify that. And, and uh, for instance, uh, uh, in the bio design program at Stanford, which is to try to teach entrepreneurs, I don't know that you can treat teach entrepreneurism, but you can give somebody who's oriented that way uh, a lot of tricks of how things that you can do and the process you can teach and to give them more arrows in their quiver when they go out to do these things. And one of the things we do there is uh, have somebody stand in an operating room for two hours and write down every idea they get. So if you look around in an operating room, for instance, which is a, a good, I, I call them target-rich zones. Target-rich zones are operating rooms, uh, bedsides, uh, reading in journals. Uh, another is a hardware store. I used to love to walk along and see the clamps and, the, and this and that and the tools. And then another is uh, gourmet cooking stores because... Nice. There's a lot of commonality between food and meat preparation and surgery. So uh, you you see things and then you combine them. And that's how uh, how new and novel and inventions occur. They occur from things that are already known. And then frequently it's something that develops in some other field, not necessarily yours. And but that item is applicable. And it becomes the missing link of all the things you know that allows them to be a new and novel way of improving something. And yeah. that, and it doesn't, it isn't always a, a Shazam moment. It kind of sometimes is. 
Uh, but you take the uh, uh, the the Gutenberg press. There was n that is only a combination of things were that were very well known. Uh, ink was known, uh, movable typeface. I think in China for four hundred years, uh, certainly paper or skins were known. You could write on them or print on them, and the wine press was well known. But nobody put those combinations together until. Gutenberg did that. And there, there was a new invention. Yes, it was for printing, but it, it changed the world right. in many, many ways. And so that's the kind of thing that as an inventor you try to do is not just invent a hula hoop of a different color, but I would ask most inventors, and particularly in medicine, to think of things that you think is going to improve health, because that is the responsibility of the physician whether it's in your city or your hospital or your state or your tribe somewhere, is that you're the guardian of the health of, the, uh, of your you know, fellow travelers in uh, whatever structural society you're living in. Yeah, no, I, I think that's great. Because mm -hmm. I, I think it applies also to not just health tools, but health delivery and innovation in health delivery and, and what we can bring from other fields to help deliver healthcare better. Yes, it's not just an instrument. It, it's a system many times. Right. right. And so, you know, when you talk about educating patients, there's a lot of stuff about education that's not actually app applied within the medical world to help educate people about their problems. Because I think mm -hmm. one of the biggest problems is how do people understand their hearing loss and what to do about it? That's a huge challenge in my world, mm -hmm. what I see as a problem. Well, that's, that's uh, another thing that I think is extremely important is uh, that the hearing impairment not be positioned as a, a, only a deficit of audition or hearing the sound, but its implication with your life and uh, the way you do things, your relationship, the your relationships, uh, the isolation that you start to have because you don't want to go to that meeting because you don't want to ask a dumb question, or you don't want to go to that uh, a birthday dinner for your uh, grandson or something because you'll sit there in a very noisy restaurant for two and a half hours, slightly smiling and nodding, and you're so fatigued at the end of it, you're ready to go home and go to bed. And uh, that's because you're just eating up your cognitive load with trying to seek out the signal. Yeah. And, and uh, hearing impairment, uh, the success in treating that uh, in many ways, you can obviously do some surgery, I think is in uh, uh, presenting to the patient uh, what you're trying to solve. And you're trying to solve that isolation problem, basically. And it keeps them vibrant and, and keeps them in the game. And that's what the value is. And I think, you know, particularly with ear lens, I think we have a chance to elevate that because here, this is the first time the physician has ever really been, except for cochlear implants uh, and, and that type of thing, has really been involved. And it gives us an opportunity uh, to, for the patient, they'll tend to follow what a doctor tells them if they, you know, trust the doctor. And it's a great opportunity for we otologists and ear, ear nose, and throat doctors uh, to change the, change the game and make it not just something that your grandfather had, but this is going to improve your lifestyle, your happiness, and uh, your productivity. Yeah, one of the things I've been thinking about a lot is, is, is um, you know, is the concept of going to the symphony, right? So when you go to the symphony, you're trying to have the ultimate hearing experience, right? And so the building matters, right? So that shows you that it's not just the instrument. It's not just the instruments mm -hmm. that the musicians are playing. Um, the, the maestro matters. Um, you know, how you present yourself matters, right? Like, like the whole experience of going to the symphony and getting a great hearing experience is just beyond just the instruments and that meet that going to your ear. There's a whole context. And I think that's what you're talking about too, is, you know, the, the, the listening environment you're in your brain, whether or not it's ready to receive that information. So the, uh, the ear lens is kind of at the middle of that whole thing, but getting people to understand the whole milieu that is involved in uh, the hearing experience is, is an important thing. Cause 
people will say, well, I don't hear a background noise. And it's like, well, many people don't hear a background noise because it's almost impossible in some background noises to right. hear and understanding that concept. And we sometimes focus in just on the technology. But I do think that ear lens is a game changer in terms of that, personally, in my my practice. Mm -hmm. So, Yeah, well, the, 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 the statements that we get from people who really are receiving all the benefit from the ear lens are amazing. Yes. And and uh, uh, that's uh, I think that's one of the things that make being a physician or a surgeon, both the physician and surgeon so good. You know, in all the business things I've done, you know, it's great to have a company that's very successful or goes public and everybody's all you know happy about it and everything. But I don't think that uh, there's anything like in surgery, if you do surgery or a cochlear implant on a child and. The parents are so grateful or patient comes in and says, hey, doc, thank you very much you know, for that operation. I can hear back again and everything. Those are very, there are very few other places and occupations that you can get that kind of satisfaction from a human to human standpoint. Yeah. And one of the things that I agree a thousand percent, one of the things that always hits me is when the spouse thanks you. And, mm -hmm. and that really brings it all contextually, how much it affects the relationship, right? That the spouse says, I have my husband or wife back again because they can now communicate effectively. So it really drives That's, home that whole concept. Uh, you're exactly right. Oh, it's great stuff. So tell me, you know, I mean, I know you spend doing different stuff all day. Like what, what's the most interesting part of your day in terms of solving problems or what type of things do you do during the day that are, you know, what's the most interesting part? I know you do a lot of great stuff. So just kind of curious. Well, uh, you know, here the last uh, last year, it's you know, you're in the bunker, and uh, and you have a lot more time to think, uh, and 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 problem with that, you come up with this and that, but you don't have time to do them. Uh, and the, I think one of the things that that I enjoy that I wish I'd done much younger is uh, uh, I get up, well, I've, I've got up early in the morning for a long time, you know, doing things and surgery early, et cetera. But is taking time in the morning before you get on uh, the rat race, before you check your emails, before you start to be the machine that is solving problems or doing this and that, is to take some time and just think. Uh, and, and I, I, I now do that every morning I get up and I, uh, my wife isn't up and I go down and I make a, a cup of uh, green tea and I sit, I put the headset on, I listen to say yo-yo ma and cello sweets, uh, and listen to music. So you're stimulating the hearing and everything. And then also you're 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 feeling that, and then actually now this sounds a little weird, you know. But uh, then I have a banana. Well, you smell the banana, you eat the banana, and you're just thinking. You aren't thinking about I've got to do this right at that point. And then after that, you you start to think now what do I need to do today globally, or what's the picture the coming up in the next few days or month. And then after kind of thinking about that a while, then you, you start to have to get into what do I need to do today? And so then you kind of do that. And then you, you flip after, you know, that may be a half an hour, all that. Right. And then you flip into action. It's just like the guy in that movie showtime. Right. You know, now's the time. You got to perform and perform doesn't mean perform, but it means do the things you like to do, have the interactions you want to do and um, try to make your day interesting. Yeah, there's a guy I read. I don't know if you ever heard of him. His name's Perry Marshall. He talks about um, Renaissance time, which is exactly mm -hmm. he says, before you pick up your phone, before you do anything, take you know a certain period of time in the morning. And have that renaissance time where you're alone in your thoughts trying to, and he says, you know, the subconscious brings things up and all mm -hmm. these ideas come from that time, not jump on your phone and see the bad news or the bad email or what you have to do. You need mm -hmm. to have that alone time. For me, I find that on airplanes, believe it or not. Um, 
when I go on flights, I usually get a lot of my heavy thinking done because I, I don't have any of the other distractions. You, you know, that's an interesting thing you say that I've had so many good, good ideas on airplanes. And in fact, one time I had, this sounds absolutely silly. I know. <laughs> But one time I, I was thinking about this problem and I, and I was so busy with you know, surgery and, and all, all the other stuff. I thought I need some time to think about this. And I almost got a flight to Chicago and turned around and came back thinking why I get these on airplanes. I get ideas and I need idea time. And maybe that's the only way I can grab about, you know, uh, three and three hours or three and a half hours times two uh, to get that now. And, uh, and the other I, place I, I recommend is uh, a whitewater rafting trip on the Colorado. No cell service, nothing. Uh, yes, seven right. days of mem- of uh, you know it's social interaction, but a lot of time to think about problems. It's it's pretty amazing. Yeah, but on the Whitewater River, you're using your cognitive load in something else, I hope. Well, the beauty is there's usually guys who pilot it for you. I will tell you a funny story. Yeah. So, uh, you know, I, I trained under Dr. Brackman, and uh, he was talking about one time where he was on like a 10-hour flight, and he was writing a chapter for a book, and uh, there was about an hour left, and he turned to his wife. She's like ready to get off the, the flight, and he goes, gosh, I wish this flight was about two and a half hours longer and I could finish this chapter. And he's like, my <laughs> wife's looking at me like I'm crazy because I've been on a 10 hour flight. But like he had that un- uninterrupted time to get the work done and the, mm-hmm. the, the thinking and the writing. And so it, it's kind of an interesting juxtaposition that people find these. Uh, it's hard as a physician to find uh, uninterrupted, uh, you know, kind of your own time to think about stuff. Um, so mm-hmm. it, it's funny that it's a it, kind of a universal challenge for people who want to solve problems. So. Yes, yes. And that uh, the ability to think and to have some isolation where you're, you're with your thoughts is not a lot of people do that. It's do something, do something, go to bed, get up, you're back in the action. Right. And, and before long, you know, a few months go by, a few years go by. And if you wait too long to do that, your life goes by. And yeah. so you miss a great part of, you know, smelling the flower or just looking at the flower. And those kinds of things, uh, I think, are probably good for the brain and good physiologically. Yeah, it's funny. Uh, my son was in Cub Scouts, and it's kind of a weird story, but uh, they would do announcements. And every time at the end of the pack meeting, they say announcements, the kids would go, announcements, announcements, what a terrible way to die, what a terrible way to die. And the whole point was... <laughs> Like it's just this mundane stuff. They just want to go and do stuff and not have to listen to a bunch of announcements that they don't really care about. And so mm. it's the same concept, right? Meeting death by meetings, as people talk about, where mm. you know you're just meeting all the time and you're not actually thinking or getting stuff done. Mm. Yeah. So, so. so um, what advice would you give to people who are trying to innovate in medicine? Like if you could give in, I mean, you've done a lot of it. Uh, I mean, I think you've probably accomplished uh more innovation, uh, you know, for multiple lifetimes uh, for people comparatively. So, which is amazing and really uh, brings me a lot of respect for you, Dr. Perkins, and the great things you've done. But, you know, if people are trying to innovate in medicine, what advice would you give to them? Well, I, I would say going back to the earlier, I, I would keep up trying to innovate in medicine because I believe it makes medicine more interesting. By far, uh, uh, you know, one of the p- problems that happens with with doctors and as as in other professions also, is you you really want to do this and then you do it for a decade or so, uh, but you fall into fall into a pattern of just doing the same thing, the same right. thing, and so you get, you kind of get a little burnout. Whereas earlier you had all this time before you to accomplish this and learn this operation or do a lot of is to keep keep your mind thinking ahead of other things that you can do and not settle in so that uh, you end up uh, you know in your 50s or early 50s or somewhere along in there and it, and you think wait a minute uh, I I'm, I'm kind of tired of this what do I do now it's harder to make a shift then but if you have always looked at, hey, what else can I do that's interesting? And most of mine has been in surgery. What else is interesting in surgery in different fields of medicine, frankly? 
it makes the whole practice of medicine much richer. And I think you can actually bring more to your patients because you're you're tending to keep up on things, you know what's the latest, and you're you're not. Uh, trapped in just what you learned in residency. And as, as we know, doctors, they're hard to change uh, their uh, practice or habits, but time changes and there are different opportunities and different ways to treat things. And I think it makes your practice much richer. Yeah. I mean, uh, you know, on a personal basis, uh, if you, my journey towards really having interest in hearing loss and how it's not well treated non-surgically, mm-hmm. but I mean, through technology, it's because over and over again, I had these patients come in who said they had hearing aids that didn't work for them. And so not that I didn't know about audiology, but I've delved very far into fitting of hearing aids, adjustment of hearing aids, why they do and don't work, what people expect out of them, more than I think the average clinician is because I'm interested in that problem and why it's not a well-solved mm-hmm. problem. Mm-hmm. Yes. Well, and it, it, it goes, that goes in jumps too, you know, the uh, at Resam, we were really the first to introduce high-tech signal processing into the hearing aid industry. And and those algorithms and patents and everything, everybody's doing them now, of course, right. and they're all the same. And we go through periods of time uh, that the technology is getting better and better, but then it plateaus. And maybe a decade or two has gone by. And there's new technology coming on. And I think we have to start looking earlier to nurture that new technology and uh, to bring things along just as a, a new operation comes about that right. solves a surgical problem better. Uh, you can't stay with the same thing forever unless it's either perfect or there, there's room for improvement. And that's, that's back to that operating room observation. If you see a doctor that's complaining about something or a nurse is complaining about opening a package or hey, this is the wrong thing or something like that. If you see something that's been in an operating room for decades, it's either perfect or there's a big opportunity most of the time to improve it with with new technology. And so it's it's also not an acceptance of the gold standard. The gold standard infers... The gold standard, you know, it's a gold standard. It's the best we got, but there isn't anything else yet. Right. There's that innuendo in that term. And I think in looking at your practice, uh, looking at the way patients are flowing in the office, uh, the setup, uh, you know, what do they see when they come in? How are they treated? Uh, preparing them psychologically uh, for surgery is very important. Would you communicate uh, to them? How, how you communicate them? to them. And uh, one of the things that I always did uh, that was explained very in very much detail to the patient what we were going to do. And then I would have my surgery nurse explain what's going to happen. They're going to be in a prep, prep room. They're going to be given an IV. They're going to get a little sleepy. They're going to the operating room. There's going to be noise and pans and bright lights and everything. And so they know what to expect and their blood pressure is down. And, and then they would see the nurse that had talked to them about that in the operating room. So they aren't just in suddenly a completely different environment. And so that psychological psychology has a lot to do with surgery, too. Agreed. You, you can do tremendous amounts of operations under local anesthesia if you have the patient properly prepared psychologically and you use the right, you know, uh, analgesics and everything. And, and all of that makes for, I think, a, a better quality medicine. Yeah, it's a, that, that rings so true. So, you know, there's been this opioid crisis, right? And so one of the things I've changed is I do an occipital block on all of my patients with a, uh, you know, long-term anesthetic. And I think that helps them, but what also helps them a lot is I tell them in the preoperative and before I say, look, I'm going to numb up this whole area. It's going to really help control your pain. You're not going to need as much medicine. And I know it's anecdotal, but I can tell you, I get much less phone calls for pain medicine requests now than I did when I was actually giving people opioids and narcotics. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Yes. Yes. And also, you know, the, the, the instruction of the, the patient's family is very important. Uh, because then they be, you, you make them 
I don't not make them, but they become part of the team, of the improvement team. And so, and they became become less apprehensive about that patient going home right. and that, uh, that there's not something drastic that's going to happen. So the, the care in medicine is multifold and an operation doesn't begin when you use a scalpel and make the first incision. It begins long before. The, uh, there are so many factors in the outcome that have to be, you know, sort of husbanded into sh- into position or shepherded into position to have what you consider and everybody considers a good outcome. Yeah, well, it's interesting. We're thinking alike because uh, I'll I'll talk about it another time. I know, but uh, I've been working on developing a whole uh, educational delivery system for patients around surgery and care that de- that, that delivers things in a uniform fashion consistently for the family, for the patient. And that's uh, rapidly developing within my practice. And so I'm, I'm doing exactly what you're talking about. Great, good. So, yeah. so Dr. Uh, Perkins, like, you know, I like to ask people, you know, so if you were to like say, who are the people that I would thank in terms of your whole career and pathway, who are those important people you would thank? Well, there would be a large number of them. You know, I think, you know, as we uh, somebody thanked up, you, by the way, somebody I interviewed, <laughs> where you were in his top three. Just a oh, little. Well, thank you. That's good to hear. Yeah, I, you know, I think we all, uh, growing up, we look for somebody that that has answers we do not have, and you think there's one person around that, boy, if you knew what they knew, you would really have your ha- hands around everything, right? Right. I'm not so sure that's true. I think we learn from many people, and you learn something a little more from this person. You know, surgically, you learn from this person. Uh, uh, one mentor of mine, uh, you know, was it was, it was uh, uh, you know, in business, and I learned a lot from that person. Uh, and these things are all part of the richness of passing on to the others. We're all built, we all stand on the shoulders and make progress of others. And, you know, I can, you know, Howard and Bill House were very great mentors of mine. Uh, Bill in in risk-taking and doing things new. And then Howard was very, uh, very helpful in kind of politics and (laughs) the way you treat people and everything. And so then others, you know, uh, uh, Eugene Kleiner in business, uh, he became my mentor. You know, he invested in one of my companies. But after that, uh, I would visit him every, you know, few weeks or a month in his home. And we'd talk for, you know, a few hours. And uh, you you learned a lot uh, besides just the, how do you do business in the venture venture type things right so uh, these are the things and you can learn a lot from a lot of other people this the way they will treat you you that was nice uh you want to treat people well and you want to understand as much as you can as fast as you can and young as you can because you only have so many years to play out the deck yeah, uh, I, I, I think those are all true. I, I really appreciate <laughs> your, your wisdom, Dr. Perkins. So uh, today we've been talking to Dr. Perkins, who's a medical pioneer and inventor. He uh, is the developer of uh, Earlens. Dr. Perkins, if you, people want to get a hold of you, how do they get a hold of you? Well, you, you could uh, get a hold of me on my website. Um, I, I, don't the- have a, I don't have a website, but I have an email. But I, uh, I'm not sure. That, they can get a hold of you through Earlens, right? Uh, yes, they can. Mm-hmm. Yeah. All right. Uh, and if you know, uh, if they want to get a hold of me, maybe they could talk with you. And, <laughs> and uh, <laughs> right, I'll screen them for you, Doctor Perkins. Yeah, okay. right? Fair enough. Yeah. I think that's yeah. fair enough. So yeah. Well, Doctor Perkins, yeah. thank you so much uh, for coming on. I appreciate it. Uh, it's been a really wonderful talk. Thank you so much. Good to talk with you and keep it up there in in Phoenix. Thanks for tuning in to the Listen Up podcast. We'll see you again next time and be sure to click subscribe to get updates on future episodes.